Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for tuning in to the Salmon Trout Steel Letter Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Fishfield and Daiwa. If you haven't checked out Fishfield selection online, uh, check it out. Not only do they have some of the most applicable gear um, to salmon trout, steelhead, and saltwater and other fisheries, but they are a wonderful source for Daiwa fishing products. In particular, some new reels to check out. Fishfield, thank you for sponsoring this podcast, which is about salmon fishing with 360 flashers. And I'm going to call this 360 flashers, the deep dive. And I am interviewing a good friend of mine, um, someone who has fished the Columbia River and its tributaries for a long time. And as a 360 flasher fisherman has really kind of studied the details. So I would like to get into the details. So Tyler Craft, first of all, Thanks uh, for being on the Salmon Trout Steelheader podcast. Can I, uh, first of all, just real quick, ask you, when did you start fishing 360 flashers? So it was back in uh, 2015. That was the first year I started doing it. And uh, it's kind of one of those things, you know, it was definitely done more on the east side of the state for a while before that. Mm -hmm. And then it migrated over here to the west side. And pretty much ever since then, it's been no looking back. You know, it's, it's cut it's the curve. It's it's made and, everybody a deadly fisherman. It, it has. And every time you think that the 360 flasher is not going to go somewhere, you find out people are using it in some strange area. And even in these small tidewater areas and such. But now you tend to fish um, bigger water, in particular the Columbia River. So can we just kind of start off, first of all, for if you were to kind of describe the basic 360 flasher setup. Now, most of the listeners here might be used to it. Some of them might not. But let's just go from top to bottom from your main line. What comes next? So from my main line and your sliding snap for your weight, I run a six bead bead chain. Uh, and then from that, I usually run a bumper anywhere from 18 inches to 24 inches. Okay. Uh, the shorter you run it, the faster that flasher is going to rotate down below the surface, the longer you run it, the slower it's going to be. So it, it all depends on the fishery that you're doing. Anywhere from 18 to 24 inches is, is going to catch fish. So I would assume in the case of go shorter would be better in slower water? Yeah, so if that... you're, the way I look at it, if I'm fishing a slower water or if, say, the tide's slack or you're above Bonneville Dam, I really like running a shorter bumper to my flasher because then I'm more in control of how that's going to work. I control slower, and it's going to work slower. I control quicker it's going to work quicker. Hmm. So I'm a little bit more in control. Uh, the 24 inch is kind of your standard. If you're just getting into this fishery and mm -hmm. kind of figuring out your bases, 24 is perfect. It's going to catch fish. You're going to have tons of success and it's going to be continuous. Once you start doing a selective fishery and you start figuring out and see what's going on, then you might start playing with it. And some days running that shorter bumper length to your flasher is going to make all the difference where mm -hmm. some days they might like it back a little bit longer and just a hair slower. So how much are you going to play with that? Is it just when you're, when you're doing a new fishery or say in a fishery where you've already had success with like a 22 inch bumper, for instance, would you play around with, with a new 18 for any reason or, or would you just kind of stick with that? So I usually don't go too off course. Uh, I'm really partial to the 18 inches. But for a good example, this last spring up at Drano, I was playing around with uh, 20 to 22, and it seemed like, even though that's not too far away from 18, running that 20 to 22 made all the difference, you know, and uh, hmm. sometimes also playing with the leader length behind that flasher. For sure, and, and, let's, and let's get to that here in a minute, um, but the whole 360 flasher has a lot of details to it, so I want to go back. Do you use one of those line lock swivels at all? Yeah, so I, I personally, I'm a huge fan of the VIP line lock swivels. I yeah, think, and that's what I've used. Too, yeah, yeah, I think those are the best out on the market. And by the way, guys, if you haven't checked it out, Dave Stangle Free actually has a pack called the 360 Pack, um, which comes with 18 and 22-inch bumpers that are awesome, uh, work great with the, with the 360 flashers. They also have the stainless steel uh, weights, I think in like 12, 14, and 16 ounces and such. Um, all the stuff that he's describing with the bead chain and the VIP line lock swivels come with it plus the weights. And so what you got to do is make sure you got your main line and then you got your leader and your spinner or your super bait or your spin fish or your spoon and what have you. And we'll get to all that here shortly, but let's move back up to the top of the rig. So you got your main line, you've got a sliding weight. I, I'm on like uh, one of those fish finder slide type things. Yeah. I'm one of the VIP line locks. I use a sliding weight. Exactly. Uh, yep. 
it works good so that way you never have to worry about somebody accidentally netting the lead and then you being in a stationary fixed position this yes. one slides so say your buddy accidentally messes up and goes to net a fish and somehow he nets the lead and the fish gets away you still have that continuous motion to where the fish can run you can continue fighting it and you're not going to lose it okay now in terms of the weight itself that you're putting onto that line lock swivel um what how low do you go and how high do you go and then what are the averages so that's, in the Columbia River. If I'm just fishing the Columbia River, it's me and just a couple friends fishing, say, two, three rods. I really like fishing 12 ounces of lead. Feel 12 ounces will pretty much fish any scenario in the Columbia River. If you're fishing more than two, three rods and, say, you have four, five, six rods out, then you definitely need to stagger your lead, stagger your lead so everybody's fishing the same depth, but nobody's getting tangled, mm -hmm. you know, and... Uh, some areas, I know people will fish 20 ounces, 16s, 12s. I feel like if you're fishing six rods, a 16, 12, and 10 out the back is, is mm. really good. You can't go wrong with that. Unless, of course, there's a lot of boat traffic around. Yeah. In if which case, you got to hang them low sometimes. Yeah, or if you're fishing down at buoy 10, you know, it's all about your current, your tides, the people around you, how close in proximity you're fishing, mm -hmm. and that will tell you what you should be running. You don't want to be say around 100 boats right next to you and fishing six to eight ounces of lead 50 feet behind your boat or so. for sure for sure that's a recipe for disaster but one of the interesting things about the 360 game is it kind of changed the idea of fishing for suspended uh and and fish on the bottom and such and so a lot of times in a lot of fisheries it's going to a certain number on the line counter rather than finding the bottom now have you Fish fisheries where you're finding the bottom and others where you're suspending, or what's your what's your experience with that? So, in my mind, it all goes about with your current or your tide, uh, and watching ha and having good electronics. You know, your electronics aren't going to lie to you; they're going to tell you exactly where those fish are, whether they're ten feet off the bottom, five feet off the bottom, or right on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then it's just adjusting your gear to match where those fish are at. So, what are you going to do if they're tucked in tight to the bottom? So, if they're tucked in tight to the bottom, usually I'll let out some line, I'll find bottom, and maybe a crank or two up above, bottom will be will be perfect, because I mean, really? fish can see up, you know, they're not going to see down below. But just a crank or two with that 360 going around, it seems a lot of people don't go that close. Yeah, it just depends how close they're tucked to the bottom, you know, I mean, as long as that 360 can rotate, and you're not hitting bottom, mm -hmm. and you continue to start maintaining that one pump a second, or maybe just a hair quicker, mm -hmm. that is perfect. I mean, you are you never, talking with a dropper or no dropper? I personally don't run droppers. I know a lot of people in certain fisheries will run droppers, so that way if their lead hits, they know they can do another crank up and their flasher's still rotating and you're not yeah. getting tangled or snagged. But I personally, I, I don't fish a dropper. Uh, your lead usually is going to be below your flasher in any scenario because you're mm -hmm. using a heavy enough lead, so I feel true, like you don't really true. need a dropper. But a lot of people run droppers, and a lot of people that run them are very successful. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So um, let's go back to the thump you just talked about. Um, so when you're running these 360 flashers, uh, usually with a little bit longer rods, I myself run either a 9.3 or a 10.6, um, but you're looking for a specific action on the rod. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Currents, different types of water, what to look for, can, you know. So your biggest thing is just maintaining that one pump a second. That's I mean, that's how I learned it. That's what I've tried to maintain. Uh, it depends what kind of fish you're in. Sometimes maybe a hair slower can work, but you can never really go wrong with going a hair faster. If I had any great advice for a 360 fishery, don't go slow. Always go quicker than what you really think is necessary. Really? That That's my yeah. advice. So kind of opposite of sockeye trolling. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, and I certainly seem to hear that a bit. The... The thing about those 360 flashers is sometimes you're reeling them in, and at least in my experience, I think a fish is following for a second there, a very big, realistic flash for a second there. Now, with that in mind, can you tell us about flasher colors, types, what, what's the, what are you looking for in a flasher? So, I really think, even though flashers are kind of all molded the same and do a lot of the same things, to me, a good flasher is like a good plug. You're going to get some flashers right out of the box, and they're going to whack fish. You're going to get some flashers right out of the box, and they might not thumb correctly. They might not whack fish. And I have played with them over the years. It doesn't matter what brand you're buying. Mm -hmm. They all are doing the same thing for the most part. Yeah. And it's just finding those flashers that always thump hard. 
correctly. So can you tell, or is it just when you find out the fish are biting them? So I can usually tell. You'll see. I run... I have one on my rod, by the way. That I, For some reason, I haven't lost it for years, and it's just a fishy flash, yeah, no matter what I put behind it. That's what I have going on. I have a few of them that I've had for a long time, and they're always my top ones because it doesn't matter what season we're in, they always produce fish, they always work really hard, and they just, to me, they give that correct kind of twirl underneath the water, mm-hmm. and it must be what the fish want. And so what about the uh, colors and finishes and stuff for them? So chrome is by far the best. It doesn't matter. I've fished a lot of them, seen people fish a lot of them. There's different scenarios where color does help, but I know hands down if you had to buy one color chrome is the color that you want and then just play with it from there i mean lucas was out out fishing with me this morning and i'm very partial to having chartreuse on my flash yeah i noticed that you had the tape because i was asking you about tape and you had uh, a couple of little pieces of tape on the chrome flasher chrome flasher in fact the one i mentioned that's that's what i have um and that one, every time I reel it up, I almost think it's a fish. And it's there's got to be something for the realism. But then that contrast, you had that green chartreuse tape. So um, if you had to um, kind of get into the color game on flashers, besides chrome, what are some other nice things to have along with that? So besides chrome, I would stick to your basics. I would go chartreuse, orange, pink. If I had to fish multiple colors. Okay, yeah. Yep. Stick very basic you know those colors produce fish yep you know those are going to work okay so we talked a bit about the rigging the lead the flasher the the bumper length now we um come down to the business end um and with the bumpers you know you're going with heavy you know people do the leaders with the crimps and all these various things dave's tango free has them pre-made with uh they're kind of coated and everything um wire bumpers but now after that uh after the flasher what kind of, let's say, let's start talking spinners now. So spinners, I know you're uh, a very dialed-in spinner fisher, uh, fisherman to the extent of changing out your blades constantly and doing all sorts of stuff with beads and various things. Um, what type of leader are you running on spinners for kings? So when I'm fishing the Columbia River in the fall time or it's backwater, say, above the dam, Drano Lakes, places like that, mm-hmm. I run a minimum of 40 pound. Uh, you can get away with running 50. I feel like 40 pounds just fine. Mm-hmm. You can hook a few fish on 40 pound, and you don't have to worry about retying. Okay. What do you think is too light? I would not fish anything less than 30. Because mm-hmm. uh, I usually do 30. Yeah, 30, 30 is fine, you know, especially if you have a good quality line. Mm-hmm. 30 is fine. Uh, I just like fishing 40 because I can fish it all day, hook and land fish, and I know that leader is good for the day. For sure. Now, um, so... I notice so there's a lot of, you know, the 3.5s are very popular and all that stuff, and you can just time on, but I notice that you're actually uh, running a clevis directly on your line and such. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So I really like running soft spinners, is what people call them nowadays, mm-hmm. uh, just a whole monofilament rig. Growing up in anchor fishing, I only ran and built spinners on wire, but with this whole 360 revolution, in my mind and just from my experience and what I've seen, the soft spinners, you get a better action behind your flasher. With that okay. stiff piece of wire, I, and it's not all the time, but I do feel like you can lose some action with that stiff piece of wire, and it depends how heavy your wire is. They're all different gauges, different heaviness, mm-hmm. and uh, I just feel like running a total one piece of monofilament on a soft mm-hmm. spinner, you just get better action continuously behind your flasher. Yeah, and especially on the turns and such as well. Yeah, I didn't really think about that much, but yeah, it was interesting, um, you know, Buzz Ramsey was talking about the same thing, we were uh, fishing, we had a good time fishing with Buzz, and he was talking about uh, one of his other, one of his other buddies doing the same thing, the soft spinner approach, and then I pulled up and looked at your rod, and you had that, I noticed you do use a lot of hoochie skirts as well on your spinners. So I'm a big fan of hoochies, I run them with and hoochies. And this is, this is upriver too, which I, for yeah. me... It seems like the farther I get up river, the farther away I get away from pinks and hoochie skirts, but you're using it up there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, this is my thought on hoochies. Hoochies always have a set of eyeballs on them. Yeah. What do fish feed on? They feed on bait fish out in the ocean. Yeah. In the springtime, they're still going to hit a wounded herring. I think anything with a set of eyes on it is going to get more looks than anything without. But there are different times where just running a naked spinner without a hoochie, that's the ticket. And mm-hmm. then there's times where running the hoochie is the ticket, so... If you're going out there with a buddy, I honestly, I would run one spinner 
totally without a hoochie, just the plain tubing and your beads. And then mm -hmm. I'd have the other friend running a spinner with a hoochie. Mm -hmm. And we all know Coho love hoochies. They do. So this time of year when we're getting later into the month of September, we have strong counts of Coho going over the dam and a lot of people are hooking Coho. You really can't go wrong with putting a pink hoochie on the end of your line because Coho love it. So you're just increasing your odds of fish you're going to catch. Well, they certainly do. And uh, Tyler has been someone that I like to ask um, on the detail-oriented front of fishing because he's very, very, very specific. And I notice that about a lot of guys that are, you know, pretty dialed in. you gotta, you got to do that because in the Columbia, there's, um, you know, even though we've got 1% of historic runs of salmon, it's there's still a lot of fish around. But getting them to snap is a whole different deal. And I don't know if people that uh, don't fish the Columbia understand just how volatile it can be with the bite. And so if you're on a tough bite and you're not really, you know, you're, you're not getting bit right away, what are some of the factors you're going to start thinking about? So if I'm fishing a place that I've fished multiple times before and had success and I'm not getting bit and I have a couple rods to play around with, mm -hmm. uh, I would start maybe changing the length of your leader to your and spinner. You know, you know there's fish there. Yeah and, I, yep. yeah, and I know there's fish going by, and maybe you see some boats around you catching some. Yeah. You know, I the first thing I'm going to do, uh, change the length, of, the length of the leader to my spinner, spin fish, a super bait, whatever you're so doing. So let's talk about that first of all. Leader length in the first place. What are you going to start with on a spinner? So for a leader length for a spinner... Anywhere between 24 inches and 32. Okay, so now during that tough bite? During that tough bite, you know, uh, maybe shortening them up and making them have a little bit more action can get a fish to bite. Mm -hmm. uh, also going the reverse way, maybe lengthening them up and having a little less action mm -hmm. can go good in your favor. But if you're fishing a spinner, say it's a good day. People around you, there, say there's 50 boats around you. It's a good day. Everybody's hooking fish. And for some reason, you're not, you mm -hmm. know, you can't go wrong with that 26 to 28 inches. Okay. That's like, that's my standard. That's a consistent that's zone. That's a consistent zone that Good. I fish and Good. day in and day out, I have success. But then you can play around from the 24 to 32. Yeah. Yeah. And even you can go as short. Now, why not 20? go shorter? Because you can. I have in a lot of, you know, early on when I was doing this with me and my dad and such, I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew it was a, didn't know anything about bumper length or leader length. And I was using a lot shorter leaders and getting bit on spinners. So I have a few friends and that I talk to, and they're good fishermen, and they'll fish them as short as 18 inches, mm -hmm. you know? And the, we've learned one thing. For a long time, people thought salmon were very leader shy. You know, you, mm -hmm. growing up, people would run long leaders. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're trolling behind a triangle, on anchor, whatever it may be, people would run long leaders. We've learned one thing with these 360 flashers. Salmon steelhead sockeye not leader shy yeah you can put those things probably well at least not in the columbia no not in the columbia once I mean, they get in the river that's a diff, you know, different different story but yeah. fishing a big a big river setting you could fish your leader behind your 360 flasher i would say 12 inches at the shortest yeah all the way to that 30 inch mark i mean me personally i think 30 inches as long as you want to go for for an artificial if you're fishing bait down in the estuary at buoy 10 you have to run a long, longer leader in order for your gear to work properly. Mm, okay, interesting. Yeah, so one of the one of the things that's been interesting to see, like you said, it came from kind of the east side, um, but then it headed down the river. Of course, it's ultra popular where I'm at around you know Woodland and Ridgefield and all that. But interestingly enough, it's it's it was still kind of like oh, but we don't use those down at Buoy Ten, and now it's like okay, we use those down at Buoy Ten. And then I hear of people using them in the tidewaters of little teeny Oregon coastal rivers that I've been and I've fished with a bobber or a spinner. And I'm like, are you serious? And they're like, yeah, we can see the spinner going and we're still getting takedowns. It's yeah. revolutionary. It's just accommodating the situation you're in. You know, I, I fish a few spots above the Bonneville Dam yeah. where I'm catching fall Chinook in 10 to 15 feet of water. I'm fishing my pro trolls to where I can see them turning below the surface, and the next thing you know, that rod's folded over, rip in line with a fish on. It's incredible. Yeah, it's really something. So, you know, um, besides spinners, and so for me, I've, I've got to go out with a lot of really great fishermen and, and have multiple rods out at one time. 
And one thing that I just love doing, or a couple things that I love doing, is either new fish or a new place, new river, new you know lake, whatever, or a new lure. And so I've been playing around with trolling spoons. Um, there's actually an episode on the uh, Addicted Fishing Channel coming up, which will have kind of a cool surprise uh, fish on an interesting bait. So, but but the kind of the whole concept is 360s are not just spinners. You can pull spoons behind them. I really think people should be trying that more. Um, and then, uh, but beyond that, the hard baits, basically the spinning plugs, the super bait, and the spin fish, and the you know the cut plug. What do you think about that whole scene? What has been your experience? When do you go to those? What do you like to use? Colors? Give me your secrets, Tyler, and share them with the entire podcast audience. <laughs> so there's no doubt about it. It's almost anything you put behind a 360 flasher is going to get bit. It's just mm-hmm. kind of finding that sweet length for you for a leader mm-hmm. that works in your scenarios. And uh, I'm usually pretty lucky enough. I fish with some good friends and get a fish two, three, four rods. And I will tell you one thing. It doesn't matter. We could be having an epic spinner bite. I will always have one lure, whether it's a spin fish super bait Mm -hmm. anything i always have one lure out there packed with tuna yep especially first thing in the morning and this is this is my tip that i think is sometimes it'll make or break your day Mm -hmm. first thing in the morning say the sun hasn't come up but it's just getting light enough you can fish one thing that fish can do before they can see they can smell Mm. and if you have some good tuna whatever recipe you're running you put it in one of those spin fish or super baits you put it in there those fish can smell it the, usually the super baits or spin fish are a little bit of a bigger object than a spinner. They could possibly see it sooner. Mm-hmm. And I've had multiple mornings where the first rod to get bit is a spin fish or super bait. And it's largely because it's a little bit bigger of a lure and those fish can smell it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, now, I don't mean to give away your uh, secrets, but if you don't mind, what do you like to do with your tuna? So I keep mine very simple, you know, people, depending on your fishery, they might have it dialed in all the way down to exactly what scent is going to work best. I keep mine very simple. I add a little bit of non-iodized salt, I add a little bit of slamola powder, and I add a little bit of monster bite. I I mainly fish upriver, so usually, as we all know, fish get more upriver into their spawning regiment, and they're more kind of chemical driven. Mm-hmm. So I try to add a few bite stimulants. I don't go too overboard with it, mm-hmm. but I do sprinkle in that slamola and that monster bite because usually that can make the difference of a fish biting or not biting. And I know down lower and things like that down lower in the Columbia and the estuary, sometimes just cracking that can of tuna is all you need, mm-hmm. you know, and then. Uh, where I'm fishing, usually around the dam, up above the dam, I'll start with that base recipe of just non-iodized salt, slamola powder, and monster bite. And then I always have a big bag of scents. You know, you can't go wrong with sand shrimp, krill scent, uh, prawn oil scent. You can't go wrong with just a regular good salmon scent. You know, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. I, I really like the Northwest Bait and Scent for salmon scent. Mm-hmm. The Procure Addicted Blend Salmon Scent's amazing. Uh, mm-hmm. You really can't go wrong with any of those. It's just kind of figuring out in your area and playing with the scents Yeah, what's going to be best for you. Well, you mentioned those bite stimulants, the Procure Monster Bite and Slamola. Do you use the Slamola with garlic or the just... or the? It, so I use both of them. Yeah. Uh, usually I'm really partial to using the Procure Salmon Slammer. And that has a good... A that good, has garlic in it, yep. Has a good hit of garlic in it. Yep. So uh, usually what I do with my base recipe, like I said before, I just use the non-iodized salt, a little mm-hmm. bit of that. I use a little bit of just the regular slamola powder, mm-hmm. and then a little bit of monster bite. Yeah, so those um, those have sodium sulfite and some various things in them, the bite stimul- uh, stimulants, which certainly seems to be a factor, uh, as Tyler mentioned, as Chinook get upriver, not as much of a factor... For coho but doesn't necessarily hurt um now uh as far as colors on those hard baits the spinning hard baits what what are you gonna if you could take three colors what are they gonna be three colors just like i kind of talked about flashers you know mm-hmm. your your pink orange and then usually a lot of those super baits or spin fish have a little bit of chrome in them mm-hmm. you know and that those are my three i mean i keep what it, about I, chartreuse yeah chartreuse is so I guess it would be pink, chrome, orange, chartreuse. Those are my go-tos. And most of those lures, 
it'll be pink and chrome, chartreuse yeah. and chrome, yeah, yeah. orange and chrome, you know, or... What about sizes? Sizes, now that's all preference and what you like to do. I've seen a lot of the big size, like the original super baits, those whack fish. I've seen mm -hmm. all the way down to the kokanee cup lugs, those whack fish. Yeah. Same thing for the spin fish, you know, I've seen people running the 4.0 spin fish, I've seen people running the 2.0 spin fish. They all, they all work in different scenarios, and the biggest thing is those will all work consistently. Mm -hmm. It's just really dialing in the area of the river that you are fishing, or say you're fishing tide water, or just kind of that body of water to the size of bait that you need. Now, would you fish a triangle? Yeah. Yeah. So before, honestly, before pro trolls were a thing, in the fall time, especially on slack tides or incoming tide, I used to just fish triangle flashers with a four to five foot leader to a spinner. Yeah. And troll. Now, do you still do that, though, ever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the springtime over on the Multnomah Channel, big secret right here that somebody might get mad that I'm letting this go. Triangle Flasher, five-foot leader to a Brad Superbait original. I really like the cup plugs that time of year, or even a spinfish. Awesome. That's awesome. something you don't need to worry, especially this last year. We had a huge herring shortage. Yeah. Very hard to get good bait. And I know a lot of people, and I even got to partake in it. We mm -hmm. had very good success over on the Willamette, mm -hmm. running a triangle flasher with a five-foot leader to a spinfish or a superbait. No, that's good stuff. And you heard it here uh, first, folks. So if you do run something like that, or if you if you have gotten some tips from this podcast that that are helpful, we'd love to hear it. Um, comment. It's the best thing you can do for this podcast besides subscribe to Salmon Trout Steelheader and get the magazine in your inbox. But for the rest of you freeloaders, we still love you. Just go ahead and comment and share and tell your friends about it. It's all good. Tyler Craft, thank you so much for being on the podcast here. Now, Tyler is kind of a personal friend uh, that I get to fish with. Unfortunately, you can't um, book a trip with him or anything necessarily. But um, if you like the information on this, let us know. I'd like to have Tyler back on the podcast here shortly. So, um, Tyler, thanks again for uh, hanging out and fishing. Also, if you haven't seen, there's a couple uh, videos of Tyler talking about plug fishing and a little bit of steelhead float fishing, that, some videos we did together on the Salmon Trout Steelhead or YouTube channel. So, Tyler, uh, technique-wise, what's your plan for October and November on Salmon? So the next two weeks, so about the middle of October, I'll be fishing around the dam, around Bonneville. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll keep going for Chinook till about the middle of October, and then I'm going to be moving upriver to fish our epic coho run that we have coming. Mm -hmm. Coho's already been strong over the dam, but that middle of October, you're going to see some really epic things happen kind of wherever mm -hmm. you're at on the Columbia for Are you coho. doing 360s for coho? I will be doing 360s for coho. I'll be doing the triangle flasher for coho, and mm -hmm. I'll be just pulling plugs cool that's and spinners and twitch i mean pretty much everything spinners yeah. twitching jigs i i still for my coho fishery i pretty much stay on the columbia mm -hmm. i just move to different spots on it but 360s triangles plugs spinners twitching jigs yeah you'll be amazed yeah well i want to come on up and play with some funny different things and you know have some fun with those coho it's pretty incredible so uh, again, thanks to Fishfield and Daiwa for sponsoring the Salmon Trout Steelheader podcast. And thanks again, Tyler. Let's go fishing again soon. Can't wait, Lucas. It's a good time. All right, guys, comment below. You know what to do.